फोर थ्री टू वन सर बी आर लाइव नाउ Good evening, hello, and welcome to the forty-first session of Pediatric Orthopedic Active Learning Sessions. These sessions are for pediatric orthopedic fellows across the globe, and I am very happy to share with you that some of our sessions are watched by five thousand plus people. That itself suggests that these sessions are useful to every level of orthopedic surgeons. The topic for the today's session is. decision making following video gait analysis in cerebral palsy last year uh, we had a uh, three sessions the sessions 25 to 27 with professor rainal bruner in which he really described us how to analyze video later on few of our fellows wrote to me that uh, yes you explained us how to find out abnormality but that does not allow us to decide which surgery needs to be carried out so we we realize that yes there is a gap between the finding out abnormality and decision making and this lecture or this session is basically the bridge between the two the today professor rainal bruner is going to teach us how to decide based on the video abnormality to give you a brief background professor rainal bruner is a professor of neuro orthopedics pediatric neuro orthopedics at children's hospital of both basel in switzerland professor rainal bruner has used 3d gait analysis or the 3d gait laboratory for last 30 35 years and from that he has collected a vast experience today he is going to share with us that experience but basically he is going to teach us how to make or how to find out the abnormality based on that what we see on the video and let me emphasize that this information is not available in the textbook so please listen to this lecture if you want this lecture will be on the youtube so you can revise it again and again this session will be on two parts the first part in which we will understand the theory that the each gap abnormality what could be the cause and after that if time permits then we will briefly run a case and in which we will try to apply the knowledge which we have learned in this uh, the first part or the uh, important part so with that brief introduction now i hand over to professor bruner for his talk thank you over to you Thank you very much, dear, and for your very kind words. And uh, yeah, there's little to add on, but I think I, I want to make one comment. First comment: um, it is important that you know how the decisions are made. But there is one thing which is always the same, independent of your um, possibilities, what uh, of your treatment possibilities, surgically or conservative, and that is how. deformities are defined and what the problem is so problem analysis is something which is constant which will not change which will be independent from your decisions afterwards but once you have defined the problem you do a certain treatment now and maybe 10 years later there's another way to treat but the problem will remain the same and i think for that reason it is important that you concentrate on um problem anal analysis and on uh, the definition of your problems and then you can discuss whatever is whatever kind of treatment you can do for that individual per person which will depend for you of your facilities which will depend on the momentaneous state of the art which will depend on your facilities and even on the patient himself so for that reason i think there are two different things one thing which which is more constant which will not change or poorly change during the next years and other things which are um connected at the moment which is treatment but the treatment has changed many times during these 35 years of experience that i have and i think we treat similar conditions today in a different way and i think it, we have made progress our patients outcome is better 
And the next thing what I need to say is many, many thanks to Dieren who has produced these slides. He has this uh, standard shape of slides and I think uh, um, it is really great. And my great thanks to you, Dieren, for all this presentation in details. So now I'm going to show you again um, in a summary type about the possible reasons of gate abnormalities and we mainly concentrate on the sagittal plane only because this is the plane where we actually get forward. The other planes may be of interest, but they are not that much of interest, make things far more difficult and complicated. And uh, at the knee and the foot level, there is little, uh, little problems in the other planes. So how do we treat the condition? That is uh, the basic question. The first thing is we, we have to find the abnormalities which are present. And this is something you should not concentrate on one abnormality only. You should, if, you should look for all abnormalities and then make a list of problems um, where, you, where you sum up all these abnormalities. Then you th should reason about the probable cause of this abnormality. So why did it develop and why is it causing, why is something causing the problem at the present situation? Then you need to confirm this in a way that is you have a second um, approach, a clinical approach or x-rays or whatever, and you try to confirm what you found in your first impression. And then you have to define what you can treat and, when, and how you can treat it, if you can treat it conservative or, or, or conservatively or operatively, or if it is not treatable at the moment. And that uh, is another thing. And then you should concentrate on the treatable causes and you should discuss which way of treatment with your patient as well. So sometimes you can even apply in, in uh, e even apply equally well a conservative or a surgical means. Um, and the main difference is that if you do surgery, you reach the goal in a very short time, while if you do it conservatively, then it takes a long, long period. And maybe the final outcome is then a bit more uh, difficult to, to be expected at the long term. So what are the principles of deformity? Um, we first need to know whether the deformity that you see is present or not. So if you have some kind of uh, abnormal position of a joint during function, you need to know whether there is a deformity or whether there is no deformity. And what can we have? So if, if a, a joint position is not normal, you have several options why this could occur. And one thing is that you may have um, short or overactive muscles on one side of the joint. This is, especially in spastic patients, something that you quite easily consider and you quite often um, neglect the knowledge that on the other side, that muscles can be weak and long and for that reason, under load, you can have the same deformity. So you have to distinguish between short overactive muscles on one side or long and, and weak muscles on the other side of the joint. And still you can have fixed joint contractures in addition, which is something which usually develops over a longer period of time. So first, you are able to extend your joint or flex your joints in a normal way, but you do not use this position in function. And then the tissue adapts at this situation and your muscle and your joint capsule and ligaments become short. So this is something which in your muscular patients occurs in a secondary, uh, as a secondary deformity. So let us show this in a scheme. So this, is, this would be a normal position of the foot at initial contact. But sometimes you have the foot in this position. So it is more plantar flexed. And uh, again, what is the possibility that you do not have the normal position? And they are, in principle, short muscle and overly active muscles on one side. So they can be functionally short, contracted, they can have contractures, then they are structurally short, both can be the case, or they can simply be overactive. So they are 
not spastic and not short, but they just overly stimulated for whatever reason. Maybe because you want to, to walk on your toes. If I ask you to walk on your toes, you do so without having spasticity or muscle shortness, but you still can do it. And you can have weak muscles on the other side. But the similar thing is if the muscles are overly long. In this case, the muscle belly contracts, but because the tendon is overly long, there is no effect which comes to the which which uh, has an effect on movement of the joint. <coughs> so this is the second option. And the third option is that you can have a short capsule or short ligaments of the joint or a malformated joint. This is um, in, at the ankle joint, a more theoretical um, issue. Just to show you the principle, I hardly ever have seen so in a neuromuscular patient. So usually it's either long muscles on one side or short muscles on the other side at the ankle. On the knee joint, it is different. So what do we check at the ankle joints in the sagittal plane? First, we want to know what is the ankle position at the initial contact. So does the patient touch with the heel? Does he touch with the foot or does he touch with the toes? And what is the position at the ankle joint? When does the heel lift in stance? That's the next question. So how long is the patient stable standing on his foot? What is the maximum dorsiflexion in stance? This is an important question because without having control on your tibia, you will not be able to control your knee and your hip. So if you have over, uh, uh, if you have too much of dorsiflexion in stance, you will fall into flexion. Does the foot clear when swing phase starts? So is there some, some obstacle that the foot does not uh, get off the ground? And finally, what is ankle dorsiflexion during swing phase? Let, let's come to these points. Abnormal foot position at initial contact. What are the possible causes? And again, you always remember the possibilities. You have short or spastic or overactive gastroxoleus muscles, which is called two equinus, equinus position um, when the patient um, hits the ground. Or you can have too much of knee flexion, which is called apparent equinus. We will show that later on. And you can have short or spastic hamstrings, which is actually causing knee flexion. And then for that reason, you will touch with your toes. Let's show you this. The first thing is um, what happens during swing phase. So you see, um, uh, let's, let's go back. So, so and um, the short plastic equinus is clear. Knee flexion is what we show with the hamstrings. And you see it here. The knee is going to extend normally during stance phase. And the hamstrings have a uh, need to get at a certain length. Now, if your hamstrings do not allow for this extension, the hamstrings remain short, knee extension is impeded. And what happens then is you will not be able to, talk, to touch with your heel, which should be here, here in front in your, with the extended knee, and you have a normal position at the ankle joint, but you still hit with your toes. And that is um, showing a, a toe walking without an equinus, which is called apparent equinus. There's not true equinus, it is only um, showing equinus and similar to this in the impression of uh, doing gait. And the amount of apparent equinus is this red uh, triangle. So abnormal foot position at initial contact can also uh, um, be in dorsiflexion. You can have too much of dorsiflexion, that is short or spastic tibialis anterior, which is not very common, um, but it could happen. Then the timing of your heel lift is the next uh, important thing. How long do you stand stable on your uh, on on the ground? It may be that your heel lifts off too early. That means if your if your 
plantar flexors are maybe spastic or short or both. So then when you move forward, your, um, your, your um, leg moving forward lifts the foot of uh, the heel of the ground. And another reason may be vaulting. Vaulting is a problem um, in patients where there is a leg length discrepancy, especially for the leg in swing. So if your swinging leg is too long, you need to do something to compensate for this leg length. And this is um, a, a mechanism which allows the foot to clear and to swing by. And what you see here in this um, wooden model is that you have an overly long leg in swing and because then you have difficulties to get your toes off the ground you actually push yourself up lengthen relatively your stance leg and by this get clearance of your foot on the opposite side so in this case it is not the problem of your foot in stance, it's the problem of the opposite leg, which causes this um, malposition, if you want to say so, on the stance leg. And if you treated here, the patient for this equinus on stance leg, he would actually be in even more problems because then he can't get this overly long leg on, um, on the other side by this stance leg when swinging by. So timing of heel lift, um, it may be late. So if it's too late, so if you, have, if, if you are not able to push off, then you have a weak or overly long gastrosoleus component. And uh, that means that you have no acceleration for swing. Then you look at ankle dorsiflexion during stance. If you have too much dorsiflexion, you have long, and weak gastroxoleus muscles, or you have another, another reason why this plantar flexion system, which controls the tibia, becomes weak, and that is called liver arm disorders. So if your foot is unstable or out of the direction of gait, your lever arm is short and you need more muscle strength to compensate for it, and if it's if the deformity of the foot is too strong, you actually cannot compensate anymore and you get a weak plantar flexion system, which does not control the tibia and you have too much dorsiflexion in stance. You can have too little dorsiflexion in stance. So in this case, you actually have what we have seen already, an equinus position or an early um, heel off. And that means that you are triceps muscles, the gastrosoleus complex, is either short, uh, short, overactive, or spastic. Then you, you check whether the foot clears the ground. And ground clearance in, in swing is something which is very important. And how does this happen? Now, what we see is um, if the leg swings by and nothing happens at the knee and um, the hip is not in an adequate position, you actually can't get uh, your foot forward. So you would need to bring your foot underneath the ground level to get it forward. And that is not possible. What do we do for that reason? We actually flex hip and knee, hip more and the knee uh, at all to shorten your leg for swing and um, this is what is shown here. So you need hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. And then you see that your, your, your leg for swing is sh relatively shorter than your leg in stance, and you can swing your leg by. So it is important that this mechanism is working well to get a normal and uh, fluent gait pattern and to get the, heat, the toes off the ground. If not, you're dragging or you are even not able to get the leg forward at all. So inadequate foot clearance, what could be a, a, the possible reasons? This means we have not enough flexion at hip, hip and knee. So the hip flexors or knee flexors are weak. 
or we have short and spastic rectus or quadriceps. That means that your knee is not going to flex and your leg will be overly long. We could have a, a weak tibialis anterior muscle. So if you do not pull your, your foot up, your leg remains overly long. Or you have an equinus contracture. So the, the gastrocereus muscle in is short. And for that reason, you cannot pull your foot up. And similar to weak tibialis anterior, you, you can't. You, your leg gets overly long. And finally, we have ankle dorsiflexion in SWE, and that can be excessive if you have a hyperactive tibialis anterior muscle. You see that sometimes in the in, uh, dystonic patients, or you have not enough ankle dorsiflexion. That can be a weak tibialis anterior. That means that your foot doesn't get up at all, so it remains constantly plantar flexed. Or you can have a short or spastic gastroxoreus system. Same thing. Your foot is always in a plantar flexed position. Or you can have a shut off of the tibialis anterior during swing. And in this case, actually, you first initially, when you start the swing phase, your foot is pulled up. So you get a, a certain clearance, but then your foot is plantar flexing during swing phase and you finally touch in an equinus position. This is quite often seen in patients with cerebral palsy. Now, what do we see at the knee joint? We look at the knee flexion in stance. What is the maximum? How far can, does the knee extend? What is the peak knee flexion in swing phase? And what is the position of the knee joint at terminal swing or initial contact, which is actually the same. So again, what are the possible reasons? If we have knee flexion, um, excessive knee flexion, we may have a fixed knee flexion deformity. So a contracture or malformation of the joint, or you could even have had a, um, a fracture, a supracondylar fracture, which, ha which has healed in a flexed position and you have the same problem. Actually, not quite, uh, it no, it's not rare in patients with cerebral palsy. Then we could have short and spastic hamstrings. That is um, something which we quite often um, think that is the case, but we know from uh, modeling that it's not always the case. Then we have long and weak ex knee extensors, especially vasti um, muscles, which then are incapable to produce the knee extension under load. This is something which is especially important under load. And we have weak and long plantar flexes, which cannot control the tibial advancement as we have seen before. And then if the tibia falls forward, your knee goes to flexion and otherwise you would lose your, um, your um, equilibrium. Now what we need to do is we need to check for, we check for our um, for our knee extensors. And what you do is you ask to carry out an active knee extension with a patient lying at the end of your uh, of the bed, and he should he or she should extend as much as he can. And what happens then is that he gets to a certain position, and now it is. Uh, the question whether this is a fixed deformity of the capsule, which does not allow the knee to get into more extension, or whether you can passively extend the knee further. So what you do is you grasp the foot and extend the foot passively to more extension. And if that happens, so if you are capable to extend more than the patient himself can with his knee extensors, we have an, a difference of knee extension and that is called the extension, the active extension lag. That means that in an upright position, you will be unable to control your full knee extension and will remain in a flexed position. And the more you are flexed, the, hard, the greater is the load on your knee extensors, and the, the more these muscles have a tendency to lose the competence to knee, to extend the knee and the further it uh, develops a, a knee flexion during function. 
So, knee extension during stands, what are possible uh, correct uh, possible problems? So first, what we've seen, uh, uh, knee extension, if you go to a recall ratum, so too much of knee extension, then you may have too much of knee extensor activity. Sometimes that happens. Or you may have short and spastic plantar flexors, which um, which are not too much uh, short and, and spastic, and you can have a trunk forward lean. How does it work? So the knee extensors, that's clear. If you have uh, the short um, and spastic plantar flexors, what happens is that you compensate by hyperextension. But this is only possible as far as you can hyperextend. So the more you relax, the more you can hyperextend. And the less you relax, the more you actually have a tendency to fall backwards. And for that reason, if it's too tight, the triceps, then you need to flex your knee to get uh, your equilibrium back again and uh, avoid falling forward or backwards. So this is possible if you have not too much of shortening your, of your uh, gastroxoleus system. And the other, the next possibility is leaning forward. That is, uh, that means that you shift your center of mass far in front of your knee joint center. And then you actually have a, 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 a component, an extensor moment, which works on your knee. The joint is usually pushed away from the ground reaction force. So you push the knee away from your ground reaction force, meaning into extension, and you extend your knee indirectly by your position of your center of mass. And this distinction is important because we know that we can apply an ankle foot orthosis to control this shank position and to avoid knee hyperextension. It works only in the situation where the plantar flexors are the reason for this hyperextension. If you do it for balance control, like this patient may be, or if you do it with your knee hyper, hyper ex, uh, knee extensor overactivity, then your your um, ankle foot orthosis will of, will be of no um, help. Peak knee flexion in swing. Um, if you have not enough knee flexion in swing, we can have weak hip flexors because you need to flex your hip to uh, advance your, your leg, to accelerate your leg as a biarticular pendulum. You have not enough push-off, and it's mainly the gastrox, um, which are pushing off and flexing the knee, and in, uh, in doing this activity, accelerate the leg as a biarticular pendulum. Or you can have an overactive knee extensor uh, and rectus system, which then um, impedes knee flexion in swing. And if it's too, if it's really spastic and short, then you actually have a stiff knee in swing. So this is a gradual um, um, thing. If you have, if it's not too bad, you still have movement, but you just do not, you know, do not get enough flexion. And if it's um, too much, if it's really um, very tight, then it doesn't flex at all. And if your knee flexion is excessive, um, you usually have a hyperactive hip flexors. What you use, it, uh, for example, in the case of a drop foot. So if your tibialis anterior muscle is um, too weak and cannot pull up the foot to clear the ground, then you flex your hip more than normal. And uh, what you get then is a steppage gait. The next, next thing is knee position at terminal swing or initial contact. And if that is uh, not enough extension of a flexed position, you have short and spastic hamstrings as one option. The, you need the hamstrings to control knee ex extension, to not overdo it. And if your hamstring muscles are spastic and react too early, this um, breaking mechanism is um, overly strong. Or you can have not enough acceleration in the beginning of swing phase and your knee extensors and the rectus is weak. 
even sometimes used in mid-swing. Or you cannot have enough time for the swing phase, so it needs some time to, pen, to, to use the pendle so that it flexes and extends. And if you are unstable on the opposite side, you do not have time enough to get your, le your, your leg while it pendles into flexion and extension again, and you touch your ground too early with your um, toes. This is quite often the case in patients with cerebral palsy because they have uh, um, an insecurity when they stand on one leg. So let's see what happens in terminal swing. What you see is the knee is extended, the hamstrings are long, and you touch with your heel when the foot is in the correct position. Now, if the hamstrings are short, this doesn't happen. Your knee is not extending enough. That's the hamstrings which are short. And although your foot is in a correct position, you touch with your toes, as we have seen, as an, which is called the apparent equinus. It is not a true equinus. And what do we see at the hip joint? We look for peak, peak hip extension in stance and peak hip flexion in swing. If we have not enough hip extension, we can have short or spastic hip flexors. We can have long hip extensors, and this includes the hamstrings as well. Um, it is surprising, but we have hardly ever only one part of the extensor muscles, hamstrings or gluteae active. It is usually a combination, and it results in an increased anterior pelvic tilt. Or we may have a hip or knee flexion deformity, and then you need to flex your hip to keep control on your um, balance on your equilibrium. And if you have more extension than normal, it's usually a problem of the lumbar spine. So if your lumbar spine is too rigid, stiff, and does not uh, let the option to go into low doses, then you actually you need more hip extension. Peak hip flexion in swing can be reduced if your hip flexors are weak or, and that is Another thing that patients with cerebral palsy do, you have short steps, then your um, swing phase is usually shorter. <laughs> you can have more hip flexion in swing. That means you can have an overactive hip flexors, they, um, or you make very large steps, or you can have an anterior pelvic tilt. And trunk and upper limb, there are movements here as well that you can see and that may have a reason. So trunk sway, for example, it is usually a case for a, a case in inadequate balance. You need to uh, control equilibrium. And because the leg is poorly controlled, you need, you need to use your center of the position of your center of mass to get your system controlled again. Or you can have pain. Pain is a main reason for muscle weakness. And if muscles are weak, you compensate quite often with the position of your center of mass. And pain and weakness of the hip adductors that goes together. So if you have osteoarthritis, pain makes your muscle abductors weak, but there are other reasons for weak muscle abductors as well. And you can have a midfoot break, which means the foot is not in the direction of gait, the lever arm is short, your leg goes into flexion, the leg does things that you cannot control properly and you need trunk sway to, to regain um, equilibrium. And the similar um, movements are true for the arms. That is the next thing that you use to control balance or to get back equilibrium. So I hope this was a, a clear, um, a clear summary. It's a long summary. What is this? Yeah, so what we do is like uh, we are well in time. So okay. we can take a couple of questions at this point okay. before going to the Cases. next case. Demonstration. You're we frozen. Take that questions. Yeah. Yeah, there is some problem with my network. Let me check.
Yeah, so uh, there are no questions. So let's move on to the uh, next presentation. And probably that will answer the questions. So uh, I will take that uh, presentation. Uh, I hope the slides are visible. Uh, fine. Yeah. So now yes, we uh, go to the next step that uh, we have identified the gate abnormalities with the help of videos. Then we have a long list of possibilities that this could be the factors responsible for these gate abnormality. But ultimately, then we have to decide what we need to operate, what we need to correct. And for that, uh, we are going to have this case. And this case will demonstrate the next part. So we already saw that how to find out abnormalities, what could be the uh, probable causes. And then we need to confirm that whatever may be the list of the three or four options, which one is the real cause for these problem. And as we discussed that uh, we can divide them into two component, the treatable by conservative treatment, by non-operative treatment or by operative treatment. And we need to realize, realize that some of the problem are not treatable in cerebral palsy. And that is the reason we cannot make our patients 100% all right. Because even with so much of advances in medical science, there are few things which are not treatable. And uh, once we differentiate between the two, we need to go for the next point, that is to treat the treatable causes. I would like to emphasize at this point that uh, please remember and explain to the parents that there are few things which is not treatable. Because parents always expect that after surgery, the child will become normal. But uh, it's only we know that there are few things which is not in our hand and which we cannot treat. And that's why we cannot make the child with cerebral palsy a normal person. So we are going to discuss these three in this case discussion. So what we are going to see is like uh, this is a 10 year old boy, a diaplegic cerebral palsy child has not undergone any surgical treatment, no botulinum injection, just undergoing physiotherapy. And he has presented with these gait abnormality. Now, if we apply what we have learned, that I am going to show you next, but just try to focus on this and try to note down what are the abnormality which you find. I am running this video for a minute and after that we will proceed. Okay, few things are very apparent, but uh, let's see and let's discuss. So what we look at ankle, we are going into the five step. There is a plantar flexion at initial contact. There is no heel contact, so there is no question of the timing of heel lift because heel remains uh, away from the ground. The ankle remain in plantar flexion all throughout the stance, so there is no question of ankle going into dorsiflexion. The ground clearance, yes, uh, there is no toe dragging or the foot dragging and there is no dorsiflexion in swing. So these are the abnormality which we identify at the ankle joint. At the knee joint, at the knee level, we have a flexion in mid stance. The knee cannot extend fully in mid stance. There is more knee flexion in the swing phase than what is normal. And there is the knee remain in flexion position at terminal swing and at the initial contact. So if you look at all the three factors at knee are abnormal. At hip, the hip does not extend fully in stance phase. Hip flexes well uh, to the normal limit in the swing phase. Okay, so and in addition to that, the trunk and at arm level, there is a sway which is present and upper extremity 
they are at higher level and he is using them while walking. So basically that suggests that his equilibrium is not adequate. So there is a upper extremity movement also while walking. So coming to the step two, what can be the reasons for these abnormalities? Let's see one by one. So the knee flexion can be due to short or spastic hamstrings. Could be because of the long or weak quadricep. Could be because of the third reason there is a knee fixed flexion deformity. Or it could be because of the adjacent level problem that there is a long or a weak calf muscles which does not allow the plantar flexion knee extension couple to work fully and to extend the knee. At ankle, the, there is a ankle plantar flexion or equinus that could be because of the short or spastic gastrosoleus or it could be ankle plantar flexion deformity. At this stage, the second point, the weak tibialis anterior is not we are considering. The reason is because this is a stance phase problem. The weakness of tibialis anterior is basically creates problem in the swing phase. But he has mainly problem in the stance phase. So these are the two possibilities. The waddling gait, which we, which is very evident, could be because of abductor weakness, could be because of the inadequate balance, or it could be because of the midfoot break. So now we have a various possibilities for his abnormal walking. Now we come to the next point and that's the confirmation and we can confirm by clinical examination. So what we are going to do is like we are going to add the third layer and that's the clinical examination information and then we will try to decide which factor is responsible. So let me share you the clinical findings. So usually uh, when it comes to the third point, we have history, we have clinical examination and imaging. Of the three, the clinical examination is very important. So let's have a brief examination of ankle. I'm not describing everything, but the key salient features are with knee flexion, ankle can dorsiflex to 20 degree, which is a normal. However, when knee is extended, means when the gastrosoleus one end is stretched, the ankle can dorsiflex only or remain in plantar flexion. So that basically says that the gastrosoleus is short or not gastrosoleus, the gastrocnemius is short. With knee flexion, the active dorsiflexion is possible. And there is no ankle contracture because we can see that uh, with knee flexion, the full active dorsiflexion is possible. So there is no ankle joint contracture. So if we look at the important findings, the clinical uh, examination points are the difference in the ankle dorsiflexion with knee flexion and knee extension. And that suggests that gastrocnemius is short. So that's the first thing which we confirm from gait and adding the clinical examination findings. Coming to the knee, the popliteal angle, which is a test which we carry out for hamstrings, which is 60 degree bilateral. So when hip is flexed to 90 degree and when we try to carry out the knee extension, the knee extension remains short of full extension by 60 degree. And usually that's considered as a sign that hamstrings are short. There is no fixed flexion deformity at the knee. And there is no extension leg. So again, if we summarize all these three things, the popliteal angle are abnormal. That suggests hamstring shortening. Imaging point, the x-rays which was carried out of, of pelvis is normal. We have not gone for any other x-rays because 
uh, clinically we have ruled out that there is no fractional deformity at the knee or there is no ankle equinus contracture. So now if we summarize everything, we have identified three things. The first is gastrocnemius is short. The hamstrings are short. And the third thing is his balance is inadequate. Now, the most important thing that what we can treat and what we cannot treat. Definitely, we can treat the shortening of gastrocnemius. We can definitely treat the hamstring shortening by surgery, but we cannot do anything for the inadequate balance. So that's basically we are trying to differentiate the treatable versus untreatable factors. So he underwent a surgical treatment and that was a selective gastrocnemius lengthening, what we call it a Stryer's procedure, in which we release the gastrocnemius insertion from the soleus. So that's basically lengthen only the gastrocnemius. He underwent hamstring lengthening. Now, at this point, I would like to emphasize what Professor Reinhard Brunner mentioned in his initial lectures. If I have to do the hamstring lengthening in 2024, I would be just doing the semitendinosus transfer, the only semitendinosus transfer to the adductor magnus. But before that, I used to carry out all full-fledged four hamstrings lengthening which includes medial and lateral. From that, I reduced the dose of hamstring lengthening and I came only to a medial hamstring lengthening. And then again, I reduced the dose of surgery and now I do only semi-tendinosus transfer and that's only the release of semi-tendinosus. So that's the point. The abnormality is the same. There is a knee flexion because of the hamstrings. But the surgical treatment which we are doing are changing with time. On the other end, the surgical treatment for the first component, that's the short gastrocnemius, has remained the same over last 30 years. But hamstrings has seen a lot of change. So that basically shows the pre and the post-op video. Now, if you look at, there is a significant improvement in the gait. But if you still look at, at the upper trunk, the upper trunk is still moving. No doubt, it's much less in the, than the pre-op video. But still, there is a trunk sway which is present. So, if we understand from this, definitely surgery can improve the results of knee abnormality and the ankle abnormality but we cannot change the inadequate balance or the equilibrium problem by surgery so with that i uh, stop sharing over here and we have few minutes with us and we can definitely take questions on this point yeah uh, rainal would you like to comment on the result Yeah, you just need to unmute yourself. It's an excellent result. And it was a very, very clear way how you came to this decision. I think that is uh, showing what the problem, that the problems need to be defined. And I, I know the spectrum is pretty large. So if I go through all these lists and all the possibilities, you have to filter out what you actually have in your patient. And then you come to a point where you say things are not treatable. And that is correct, but things are not completely treatable. You see, you have improved his equilibrium because he's not anymore on the toes. He is now on his, uh, on his feet on the whole. So he has a more stable basis to stand on. And for that reason, you even improved his equilibrium. You just didn't, didn't correct this problem completely. But the challenge that he had to walk on his toes is now gone. He still has the problem with equilibrium, but he's improved greatly, even in that direction. So that means that our surgical treatment facilities that we have, have even more effect on other functions that some, sometimes we think are not treatable. 
they are not completely treatable and it is not our main option, but uh, and our, not our main goal, but our options produce something in this in corrections of all these other issues as well. We cannot separate things completely from each other. It okay, was just, uh, I would like to add, yeah, we have a question from Professor Alok Sood. Professor Alok Sood is professor at uh, one of the premier institute in New Delhi. And uh, his questions are always very difficult. So let's take that uh, question first. Yeah, I, I will open the chat. Yeah, the question is, please throw light on management of Janu recurvatum. Plantar flexors are not spastic and there is no forward trunk, lean, uh, trunk lean and the patient is GMFCS3. Yeah, the difficult question, as I said, like... Uh, well, I think if, if I imagine GMFCS3 means that he walks with some kind of a deambulator, sticks or whatever. And if you walk with such a device, you actually bend forward. So what happens is that you move your center of mass in front of your knee joint. And if you then do not have any contractures and your hamstrings are at normal length or even long, in this case, your knee goes to hyperextension, independent of your plantar flexors. You can hyperextend your knee without having short plantar flexors. Okay, so uh, whether... Uh, in such case, the ankle foot orthosis work or not? If he if he is walking on four pads, meaning he has his hands on something, and he actually has uh, uh, the possibility to control his center of mass, or he's less dependent on the position of the center of mass, you could try to, to use ankle foot orthosis and it could help. Okay, he has already replied that uh, he has tried AFO, but sorry, uh, uh, his comment is AFO usually don't work. Yeah, yeah that's, basically that's exactly, what, that is what exactly what you are saying. Exactly, that's the problem. If it's not the plantar flexors which cause hyperextension, then your AFOs have little chance to control this problem. Okay, just in one question, uh, what uh, Professor Sood has explained is very right. And by changing the direction of uh, walker, so like uh, some yeah. centers, they suggest the front opening walker, something like a K walker. Yeah, something, a posterior deambulator. Posterior, right? yeah. So but does it really make any difference? It yeah, in my in, in my experience, little difference because they always have a tendency to lean forward. These patients are afraid to fall and they do not want to fall forward, but even less they do want to fall backwards. So for that reason, they have a tendency to bend forwards and to keep something in, in her arm uh, in her hands to stand on to, to get more stability. That is a deambulator. If you if you have them on sticks, they usually have the, the sticks or crutches far in front of them because they are um, they really depend on this position to have a better stability of not falling backwards. And for that reason, it is very difficult to control this recurvatum problem in these patients. And if you gave them ankle foot orthosis, they actually just do not touch with their toes. So they stand only on the heels and the toes are off the ground. That means that you can do whatever you like with your ankle foot orthosis, you have no chance. Okay, then we have a question from Dr. Fahad from Pakistan. And his question is uh, about doing a distal femur extension osteotomy before lengthening the hamstrings. Yeah, it's only reasonable if you have a flexed knee deformity. So if you do not have a fixed flex knee deformity, you actually produce a hyperextension of the knee. That is not what you want. You could do a shortening of the femur instead of a hamstring lengthening, but functionally it's the same. But what you do when you shorten the femur is you lengthen relatively the knee extensors. So you get weak knee extensors together with longer hamstrings. Again, that's not what you want in his case. 
Okay. Uh, then there is a question. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on selective gastrostomy as lengthening? Okay. Um, let me explain that uh, when we talk of a gastrosoleus, there are two muscles which are lying adjacent to each other. The one is monoarticular muscle, which is soleus, and a biarticular muscle, which is gastro. So in selective gastrocnemius lengthening, we go in the plane between the soleus and the gastrocnemius, and we release only the insertion of gastrocnemius into the like when, when both this soleus and gastro are joining to make a common tendon at that point we incise the insertion so basically that results into only lengthening of gastrocnemius we are not doing anything to the soleus because soleus is not the problem the problem is only at gastro so that's about the uh, selective lengthening Coming to the next question. May I may I give a yeah, comment? Please, please. please. This is actually not completely correct because what you actually do is you do an aponeurotic lengthening of the soleus and the tendinous lengthening of the gastrocnemii. You relatively lengthen the tendon of the gastro part, but your soleus is the aponeurosis is cut, so you lengthen the soleus as well, but much less. There is a possibility not to touch the, the soleus. Uh, the, yeah. That is, if you take, this is the first description by Strayer, I think, yeah. where you take off the insertion of the gas of the gastrox on the soleus fascia and transpose it proximally. In this case, you touch only the gastroc, but that is not done anymore because it's too complicated. No, no, no. Like, see, we uh, do routinely the Stryer's procedure. Yeah. So what yeah, you describe... We call it Stryer, but it's some kind, something like a Vulpius. We do not differentiate anymore between Stryer and Vulpius. The Vulpius is this cut in the tendon, in the... In the aponeurosis of both. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, not of both. Of the soleus underneath the insertion of the uh, gastrox. That is what we call Stryer as well. Today. Okay, no, no, no. Like say, uh, we we uh, like try to differentiate the Stryers and the Vulpius. The Stryers is done at a higher level, something like a Bowman's procedure. Yeah, but it, it, it's actually you take it. It's it's not not even it, you take the muscle insertion off. So yes. Do, yeah, so, and reinsert it more proximally. You exactly. Do not, Exactly. You do not touch the soleus fascia. Exactly. So soleus fascia is seen a uh, exactly. surface. It's exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you did this, it's a correct trial. But I realize that if you have this community where they discuss these, these, these surgeries, there is no big difference between Stryer and Vulpius today. They okay. just use it equally. So okay. Uh, then uh, we have a question from Dr. Jitendra Jain, who has again a vast experience of uh, cerebral palsy, managing the children with cerebral palsy. Uh, his question is: In diaplegic with tight gastrocnemius, even after gastrocnemius release, on examination dorsiflexion is good on physical examination, but during walking the heel does not touch to the ground. What is the reason? Is it because of poor selective control of uh, muscle or something else? Okay. This is a this is exactly a question where which is going beyond simple orthopedics because what we if we perform a movement we have a movement strategy and that is somewhere stored in our brain and if you change your um, if you change muscle length or not overly so if you do not do too much the muscle gets longer but the movement strategy doesn't change. So if the patient overactivates the muscle, he will still do so when he's walking as he's, because he's walking in a, in a matter that he has learned. And that is a problem. Also, he can even, if he's controlled well, walk in a different way. As soon as he's going back to automatic walking, then unconscious walking, then he will come back to his old, trained and stored movement pattern. That is something that I think future um, rehabilitation doctors need to address 
And uh, we need to convince the patient that he should change his walking pattern. Okay, uh, we are just uh, coming to the end of the session, but there is a question uh, by Dr. Akash Ghosh. Uh, the question is like, why have you switched to semitonosis transfer alone instead of medial lengthening? Okay, that's a very good question and that always uh, the history teaches us something. So uh, initially when, uh, uh, the first of all, I will answer the question and then uh, Professor Brunner will add on his experience. Initially, when I started doing the hamstring uh, lengthening, I was focusing only on the knee improvement. And most of them, they used to improve. Some of them, they used to go for a recurvatum, which is probably because of uh, too much lengthening of hamstrings. Later on, I realized that hamstrings are not only having a function at the knee, but they have an important function at the hip. And when we are trying to improve the, the knee position by doing a hamstring lengthening, we are creating more problem at the hip level. And that results into the anterior pelvic tilt following hamstring surgery. That's why I, I started reducing the dose of hamstring surgery. So from all the four hamstrings, to I, I came to only medial hamstring surgery. Even after that, I used to get this problem. And at that point, the professor, Paolo Selber, he, he uh, explained that uh, probably doing anything to semi-membranuses will definitely have a large effect at the proximal level at the hip. And that causes anterior pelvic tilt. That's why I'm now reducing the dosage of uh, hamstring surgery. But because this is a meeting for the fellows, let me say that there is a lot of controversy and difference of opinion at every, every level. And in every meeting, there is a huge discussion on this. Like we had Professor Freeman Miller with us and he said that even today, he does all the four hamstrings. So with that, let's have an opinion of Professor Brunner. <laughs> I actually came to the same conclusion, but on a bit a different way. I... I realize that if we do all hamstrings, we have too little, uh, too much effect on the hip. So we have too little strength in these hamstrings as hip extensors. And I then uh, re try to find out which of these hamstrings has the largest effect on the knee. And it's actually the same tendinosis, which has the longest lever arm at the knee joint. And then I thought, well, uh, then we can actually have it even more, uh, e e even easier if we only cut the tendon. I first tried to transpose the semitendinosus to the, to, to the tuberculum adductorium of the femur, so not to the tendon. And I, I pulled it tight. All these patients were in pain. So that's not the thing to do. And uh, I then didn't try to put it at the tendon because um, putting it at the tendon actually means that you have no control on tension and most probably the muscle is relatively overly long and insufficient. And I thought, well, in this case, you can just simply cut it. So cutting the semitendinosus is a five minute surgery. It does not need to have any after treatment. And in patients who are not cooperative, who are not able to undergo a major anesthesia, who, do not who are not able to undergo no rehabilitation, this is a very, very easy way to deal with this problem. So you just, at the knee joint level, make a two centimeter skin incision, pull the tendon of the semitendinosus out, cut it and leave it. And you have immediately an improvement of knee extension. And I think that's um, maybe something in cases where you have no other option. Of course, if you can keep the muscle in a certain function, it is better, but it's more surgery. And sometimes if the patient, as I said, is in a situation where either surgery or rehabilitation is not really possible, then this is not more invasive than a botulinum toxin injection. But I came to the same conclusion, just do one. Right. So basically, uh, we all are evolving with uh, our own, looking at our own uh, surgical result. Yeah. And... Once again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Brunner for sharing his vast experience with us. 
and giving us something very important information which is not available in the textbook. And I'm sure that uh, everyone attending this meeting or looking at the live streaming of uh, this meeting will learn something and definitely this will help us to improve our result and to do uh, what we are supposed to do as pediatric orthopedic to improve the quality of life of children with orthopedic problems. So with that uh, uh, vote of thanks, I would like to thank everyone for joining us and asking a very important question. Thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you very much. Yeah. All the best. <laughs> thank you.